I think at the end of the day, there were always um, pay drivers. Yeah. You know, I, I learned about quite a few of them from like the 80s, 90s. Yeah. But it's not to the point where it is today. I mean, yeah. you know, Johnny Sauter is one of the only drivers in the truck series that came out and said, I, I think like two or three years ago, he said, I'm one of the only drivers legitimately not bringing my own yeah. funding sponsorship to the table and getting paid to run a truck in the NASCAR truck series. And, you know, 15, 20 years ago when the truck series just came out, you know, almost everybody were pro legitimate drivers. And now, yeah. I mean, they're all still pros, but a lot of them are self-funded. So, you know, even looking at the movie Ford versus Ferrari, you know, um, <laughs> I saw it a few times. Yeah. So did I, <laughs> but you know, you got Ken miles who obviously he was a wheel man. Yeah. But one of the reasons he was able to drive that car was because he was able to work on it. Yeah. And, you know, I don't know as much as some of the drivers, but, but you've been around, I, I've been around and yeah. I mean, growing up, you know, obviously going to the track with my dad, helping him yeah. out. And I mean, we always prepped our own go-karts and then when we moved to spec me out, I mean, we prepped our own cars, you know, we bought the cars from somebody already built, but yep. we, um, we did everything ourselves in our garage. So, I mean, I, I think that there's not very few drivers that can actually do that anymore. A lot of drivers just show up and drive, you know, and I think that that really separates the really good drivers. Yeah. from just the mediocre drivers because mediocre drivers might not know what it takes to you know make these changes or, or what it takes to you know make the cars just go on the track i mean there's so much involved in, yeah. in making these tra these cars go on track and i'm sure part of what's helping offset um, some of the challenges of getting funding or becoming a pro driver I, you know i'm sure some of the marketing avenues have helped a little bit i mean social media so there are oh, yeah. you do have more arrows in your quiver than maybe somebody did 10 or 20 years ago but yeah. you really need probably the driving ability plus the social media presence, you know, plus the networking, plus the sponsorships. And it, you really got to have the whole package, like you said. Yeah. I mean, you know, you look 20 years ago when senior Dale Earnhardt senior was alive, you know, the, the numbers that follow NASCAR were just gin ginormous, you yeah. know, obviously they've gone downhill a little bit since then, yeah. but at the same time, while the TV ratings have gone down, the social media presence, whether it's Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, or just live streaming have gone way up since then. So, you know, on one avenue, you got a little bit of a downfall on the TV side, but you got a rise in all the social media presence. And, you know, I have sponsors that come on that they, they straight up tell me, you know, the branding on the car is cool, but we get more just from the social media side of things. Sure. And we use the branding on the car to take photos and everything to mm -hmm. do things on social media. You know, we use NASCAR as a platform, but you know, we're, we're not selling whether it's insurance, like insurance King, you know, they're not selling policies just by having their logos on the race car, mm -hmm. you know, they're going to profit from it and make a return on everything else that comes with it on social media. So how, how did you build your social media presence? Cause I know you have what close to 15,000 followers yeah. on Instagram. And is that just something that organically happened it, over time? Or yeah. did you have a, a strategy in place or you just did your thing? No, I mean, I think when I was, I don't know, I was, I was 16, 15, yeah. and I just started my page and I've just been learning and growing ever since. And yeah. I mean, I, I look at a lot of other drivers and what they do and how they promote themselves. And, yep. you know, a lot of drivers nowadays don't maintain their own social media and I still do all my own social media. So, I mean, I, I respond to all the messages and the hero card requests, you know, you get tons of these, but I think one, one reason that mine is growing is because I do interact with the fans and mm -hmm. I think they do know that it's me. Whereas when they message Kyle Busch, you know, well, first of all, he has hundreds of thousands <laughs> of followers, so you're not going to see, yeah. you know, he's not going to see the response. And even if somebody does see it, it's not going to be Kyle Busch. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's one thing that separates me. And there's a few other drivers that, that do handle their own social media and, you know, their, their social media has grown kind of like mine, but I, I appreciate, you know, I, I do take a lot of time on social media more than I probably should, but yeah. it, it does help. Well, I'm not, I'm not on Facebook anymore, but I'm on Instagram and I have really enjoyed following you on there. I remember, uh, three years. So you first ran cup was in 2017. Yes. And I remember it must've been Sunday, a sun, Sunday race. And it was in California. Yeah, Sonoma. But I course. was, uh, I was traveling for work and I ended up getting to the airport like three hours ahead of time. Cause I knew that was going to be your first, your first cup race. That's awesome. And I'm like, and again, I heard about it cause of the social media thing. And, uh, you know, I know we saw each other probably every, every few years, but yeah. you were able to more or less, you know, I was able to kind of stay in touch with what you were doing. I remember thinking, you number one, it's like, man, how cool is that? Like, you you know, went from go karting at four, and now you're in a, a NASCAR Cup race. But then my next thought was, I cannot imagine what it's like to hit the throttle the first time in a Cup race, starting the race. So, yeah. I, what what was that like? So that whole weekend was just it was awesome. I mean, Rick Ware and I had started planning that in December, so it was you know it, it felt like it took forever to get from December to yeah. June, 
And I remember the first time on track, we had some issues. I mean, Rick Ware being a small team, that was their yeah. first year in Cup. You was know, it the, was it like tires and, and resources and backups, or was I, it? Per- I think. I mean, it ended up coming down to resources. Yeah. You know, the lack of resources and funding, obviously, yeah. you know, affects some things. So you know, we got to the track, and there were some issues with the, I think the fuel cell. Just you know, we used some used parts, so we had issues with the fuel cell. So I think we missed first practice, but second practice we got there, and we um we were actually pretty competitive. You know, for for as low budget as we were. We were pretty competitive and in qualifying came around and I qualified for a said, which I just thought was awesome because <laughs> him and I were in road uh, racing hero, right? Yeah. We were yeah. in identical, identical equipment and I qualified him. And one of the first things Rick Ware said to me was, you're gonna have to watch out for him. Cause he's, he's, he's wild. He's, he's a wild man. <laughs> and he is, he passed me in the grass in the start of the race. But the one thing I remember most from that race weekend was there was a restart where everybody pit except for like me and Boris and some of the, some of the cars, you know, 25th on back. So I think I restarted like fifth and everybody behind me had fresh tires. Oh, I man. had some used tires and the Sonoma, I mean, just eats tires. Yeah. So, you know, it's a second or two difference a lap. So. Watch your mirror, right? Yeah. So <laughs> I remember my, it was my first cup race and I have all these veterans, you know, Jimmy Johnson and all these guys right behind me. And, yeah. you know, we just got annihilated and when everything sorted each other out, you know, we were right behind Boris, which I thought was pretty cool because he's been in the sport was for it, so long. Was it like the first third of the race? It was. Yeah, I remember. It was I in actually, the first I actually, stage. I remember thinking that, like, oh man, he's gonna be. Yeah, he's gonna have some fun here at this. Yeah, at this and, restart. And in the past, you know, I've I've asked my team, and my team has even told me, you know, we just want to take care of the car. Let's drop to the back. Mm-hmm. And I, I'm shocked that my team didn't have me drop to the back, being my first Cup race, being my first time ever at Sonoma. Yeah. Um, but it was definitely a learning experience and it was awesome. So when you think about the NASCAR teams at that level, how many different like types of teams are there? You have the, you know, the, obviously the, the big budget, the big sponsorship teams, I'm sure there's like a middle of the pack from a budget and a sponsorship and then some of the, the lower budget teams, but you know, and, and from a speed standpoint, like if at road America or at Sonoma from a low budget team to a high budget team, what is the, the lap time differential does that account for two seconds is it three seconds so in the cup series it's greater for sure i mean you it got you, yeah. you have teams spending you know jimmy johnson kyle bush type those teams spending upwards of 35 to 40 million dollars a year yeah. it's a lot of money yeah. and on the opposite spectrum you have smaller teams spending you know three to four to five maybe at most um so in the cup series at, at a road course you know like sonoma it's a two you know i think just over two miles mm-hmm. you know lap times are about a second different second and a half different on the road course, the driver can make up a little bit of it. Yep. So, like, when we go to Road America, you know, that's a track where I feel most comfortable out of every and you had other a, track. you like, a top 12 or top 15 there we, a couple yeah, years ago? Yeah, yeah, with BJ McLeod Motorsports. Man, that's I'm awesome. back with them this year. We nice. ran unused tires, and we finished 12th at Road America in 2017. So and that's cool. that's still my career best finish. And I remember in the past or the last five laps, you know, chasing down Elliot Sadler, he he would just pull on me up the straightaway. I mean, he probably made a, a second a lap just motor-wise. You know, mm-hmm. the difference between our motors was – he had a Hendrick motor. We had a leased PME motor, which, you know, the difference in price might be thirty to $40,000 a weekend. You know, and we don't own the motors. We run so, the cars. So they're all leased. They're all leased. Okay. Yeah, so we lease them. You know, I'm not sure what the engine bill is, but it's, it's much less than Hendrick. You know, if we yep. want to lease a motor from RCR, Hendrick, or Joe Gibbs, depending on what car we're running, <laughs> it's going to be, you know, upwards of fifty to $60,000 a weekend just to lease it in the Xfinity series. So what about transmissions? Is it the same type of program, or are there a few different transmissions you guys – you choose from yeah, yeah. so obviously yeah. we i'm pretty sure we own our own transmissions okay. in the past i know that we have leased our transmissions but we mm-hmm. own with bj mccall motorsports we own our own transmissions and um yeah we, we have different transmissions for obviously where we run uh the road courses we have special transmissions obviously mm-hmm. and um yes yeah, so, i mean I, I think that the difference between the transmissions probably isn't that it's not that big of a difference yeah. as, as it is the motors but yep. i mean you know going back to your question you know we're running chassis that we're in four to five years ago yep. so you know the newer chassis are going to be a little bit quicker um so you know at road america in the xfinity series you know if you put me in a joe gibbs car then i go out in bj mccloud motorsports car which is a couple years old you know it might be a second and a half to two second difference hmm. man which it, it's big but at the same time you know i, I think that at the road course as a driver can, talent can make up for yeah, some of that yeah some of it not all yep. of it especially road america with the, with the long straightaways yep. you get killed up the hill but it's um you know, it's part of the sport. So you had a, you had a road racing background and you transitioned to an oval at, at a certain point. And did you run Slinger for a couple of years? Uh, no, no, I've never raced Slinger yet. <laughs> I, I want to. <laughs> Jeez. Um, yeah, my first my first ever, ever oval experience was in Jefferson Speedway okay. in 2011 or 2012. Okay. And it was with a big stock car, um, not a late model. It was a, a sportsman 
not a lot of horsepower, just really big. And we ran four races and it was so long ago. I mean, it feels like another <laughs> lifetime ago. And it, it didn't really like, like the things I learned didn't translate to what I'm doing now just because yeah. the cars were so different. Yeah. You know, if I would have ran a late model or a super late model at Slinger, I think a lot of that would have transferred, but with the car I ran, I don't think much transferred. So my first real oval was in the NASCAR Xfinity series at Phoenix in 2016. Were you pleasantly surprised how challenging and fun was. it was? Yeah. I, I mean, it was with probably the lowest budget team at the time. Yep. It was a team I ran my first NASCAR race with at Road America. Okay. And they invited me back to run Phoenix and then Miami. And, you know, I grew up playing NASCAR on PlayStation 1, PlayStation 2. And, you know, when you play it on play, you know, video games, PlayStation, you think it's just easy. You know, you're, all you're doing is going in circles. And my whole career, my mindset was I'm going to go sports car racing, make this a career. And when, when this came around, I'm like, you know, I jumped on it. And I, I was shocked, you know, I still to this day find ovals more challenging than road courses. But when I went to Phoenix for the first time in a very low budget car, we didn't have a helmet blower. So it's 150 degrees inside <laughs> the car, no fresh air, um, red flags, the championship finale race, or it was the second race, the last race of the season. So there was just a lot going on. So that was one of the first times I ever like actually felt like I was way underprepared. So what makes it more challenging? Is it the sheer competition? of you know other drivers or are there aspects of oval track racing that are are that just that much different than road racing that you had to learn for the first time yeah i mean i think there's a couple of things you know one of the one of the things is obviously the chassis you're in yeah. you know you always want to outperform what you're the chassis you're in so mm. you know if we're in a, a car that's 35th place car you know like we were at the time you know i'm out there trying to bust laps off you know qualifying laps and i'm only going 35th so you know that that gets frustrating yeah. that, gets, that gets hard and, yep. and you know it mentally drains you yep. so that's, that's one thing that's challenging but also you know you're always on the limit of you know whether the car is going to break free or if it gets tight and pushes you, you want to be really close to the limit the entire race whereas road coursing road course racing you can kind of back off a little bit yeah um, but ovals you always want to stay on that limit hmm. and, and is there some technique i can't remember what it's called where going into a corner you actually try and like bind up the front end or it's something to do with the, the braking system or is is this the same principles apply as road racing or are there other techniques that are unique to oval track racing it, it really depends the track i mean okay. there's some tracks we don't use any brake there's some tracks really? we use very little brake and okay. there's some tracks we use a lot of brake you yep. know the, the short tracks we use a lot of brakes um mile and a half track like like chicago land you know we typically don't use any brake in the xfinity series in the cup series you're wide open Hmm. Um, so, I mean, the cars couldn't be any different nowadays, but the, I mean, I think the technique is the same. It is. Okay. And I think that if you're a good driver, I mean, especially now you're seeing a lot of these cup drivers who can run road courses yes. and they're competitive. I think if you're a good driver, whether you come from road course racing or, or circle track racing on dirt or asphalt, I think you can adjust. Um, it just takes a little bit of time, which it definitely took me some time. So it was like running Daytona for the first time. And, and have you run the full track and the road course? Yeah, so I've ran yeah. first. So yeah. my first experience ever at Daytona was coaching in a Porsche, um, <laughs> I think in 2015, 2014, before I really started racing professionally. And it was the road course, but I was I was shocked how, how steep the banking is. And then we went back there in 2017 in the Trans Am Series, same tracks, the road course. Was and, that um, TA2 or T TA2? TA2. TA2, okay. Yeah, and we finished on the podium, which I thought was really cool. You yeah. know, it was kind of a, a smaller team, just the car was old, but it was a lot of fun. The race started in the rain and ended in the dry, so it was cool. And then the following year in February, so like three months after that TA2 race, was my first time ever on the oval. And I remember thinking, going the first time going into turn three at speed in the pack, I'm like, is this car going to stick? <laughs> and you just, you just got to hold it wide open, and, and it does. Yeah. Um, but... Daytona is pretty challenging. You know, you look at Talladega and Daytona, and they're the same length, but Daytona is really narrow compared to Talladega. Mm. And the cars get really tight, even in the Xfinity Series where you're going 190 compared to 200 so in the Cup Series. that's pushing? Or yeah. the cars push? Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. Uh, so, I mean, especially off the corner when you're yeah. in the draft, when there's no air on the car, the car gets it, – it can do one thing. It, it can get really tight or it can get really loose depending <laughs> on what the setup is. So I still learn a lot every time I go to a Super Speedway because – I don't have much time in the draft, um, but it, it's pretty wild racing in a pack in the draft at Daytona. And you've run TA2. Have you run a, a, reg, a, TA, a regular TA car as well? No, not no. yet. I want to. I, yeah. I still think those are the coolest cars in the country. I mean, yeah. Especially the current 
generation with the, with the sequential shifters. And uh, I know you run GT1. Yeah. And I mean, it's, I still think those are the coolest cars in the country. Yeah, I've run um, I've run stock cars, I've run you know Trans Am cars, and then some of the older Mustangs too. And the Trans Am cars are just I mean, tons of horsepower, tons of tire. You know, the, we've always kind of we had braking problems, so which when you're slowing down from 185 miles an hour, it's nice to have brakes. Oh, which I know you know all about you, you've that. You've experienced that, yeah. But uh, yeah, it's still there's nothing like it. So so way way back, you started go kart racing when you were four, right? Yeah, four and a half, five. What does that process look like for somebody getting into go kart racing? You eventually got into shifter karts and you had a lot of success in that. But what does that kind of first ten years in your racing career look like? I mean, I just look back and. I remember, you know, it was just fun, you yeah. know, going to the racetrack every Sunday with, with my dad. And, you know, I remember we had a lot of family come out, but, you know, going back to my first go-kart, I remember walking out on Christmas, I think it was 2000 or it was 1999 and I was four. And I remember walking out in the garage and there was just a go-kart sitting right there between my parents' cars. So, you know, ever since then, even before that, you know, I was in love with motorsports because my yeah. dad obviously raced and, yep. um, growing up racing every Sunday. It's all I ever wanted to do. You know, there, there was a time where I started racing motocross for a little bit and, um, you know, anything with a motor, it's always hmm. what I've wanted to do. But and did you race exclusively at the karting track at road America? Uh, Delsman. So we started Delsman. just oh, in Delsman, okay. Badger car club. Oh, okay. Okay. And then when road America opened their car track, yeah. um, I want to say it was, I was probably eight or nine. Yeah. We started racing there a little bit more often. Okay. Um, we ran strictly just locally for, for the first three or four years and then we started traveling a little bit more and when we got into shifter carts it was kind of right at the downfall of shifter carts hmm. um now they've kind of come back but i didn't realize that they had there was a downfall lo- yeah locally i mean oh, i see they're like like for a while badger car club just canned their shifter car class so we kind of arranged our own makeshift little series and we ran uh, shifter carts for a while and hmm. um a shifter cart is still one of the most fun things i've ever <clears> driven <throat> in my life i mean they're fast and the power to weight ratio is unlike anything else. Maybe a Formula One car, which I don't think I'll have ever have the opportunity to drive. So, uh, shifter carts. Are How fun. many speeds are shifter carts? Uh, usually six. Six. Okay. Yeah. So, you can run the um, the stock motor, the Honda motor, yep. which is uh, it's a lot more inexpensive, and I think that might be a five speed. But the uh, the motors we ran were from Italy, and they were a six speed. And it's basically sequential. Right? Yeah. And it's like a lever on the steering wheel. Yeah. 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 They're fun. I mean, I want to get another one because. For training purposes, yeah, you, you still you still see a lot of drivers, whether they're in Formula One or even NASCAR. Uh, a lot of drivers still they're probably drive for cars. physically fatiguing. They're demanding. Well. Yeah. yeah, I remember my dad, you know, watching him in Nor- <laughs> Norway. In Norway is a car track in um, in Illinois. Mm-hmm. There's a really long bank left hander. I remember watching him like before I moved to shift for carts. Like at the end of the race, his head was just bottling, like you know, bobbling the wrong way, and they're demanding. I mean, a little different than yeah. a Group Six Mustang. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> After five laps, they uh, they wear you out unless yeah. you're uh, you know you're prepared for it. So, do you do anything to stay in shape for racing season, other than honing your skills on iRacing? racing? I Is do. <laughs> I do quite a bit of cardio. Cardio. Um, okay. W- mainly biking, to be honest. Yeah. Jump rope. Um, I've had really no issues inside the car as far as like sheer strength. You know, yeah. I don't have a lot of arm muscle, but it's mainly all cardio and, and making sure you can go the distance, especially when the races are four to five hours long and it gets hot. So when you did your first four to five hour race, what was your longest race previously or before that? Um, probably in NASCAR. I mean, I've done some long stints like okay. at Thunderhill. Yep. I've done like a three or four hour stint okay. at Thunderhill in a sports car, but it's different because it's way Northern California in December, so it's cold. So my first ever real awakening was in the Cup Series in <laughs> New Hampshire. It was uh, 2017, right after my first Cup race in Sonoma, and it was hot. It was like 100 degrees. <clears throat> um, they kept red flagging the race because they put some P- the PJ1, the sticky stuff, down, and it kept coming up. And they had like three or four red flags. And when there's red flag, you're just sitting there, and there's no circulation in the car. And I got dehydrated. Ooh, I probably didn't drink enough water. And uh, at the end of the race, I went to the ER and they put some, uh, some needles in me and they, they got me a lot, a lot better, yeah. but that was the first race where I think it was about a four to four and a half hour race. And it, it really woke me up. So since then I, I've done quite a bit more cardio, not as much as I want to, mm-hmm. uh, because the business side of things take over quite a bit. Yep. You know, if, if I had the business side taken care of, all I'd be doing is riding my bike and I'd probably start lifting weights, but, um, the business side just really takes 
over. So on the business side topic, so the the sales, the marketing, you know, managing Josh Bilicky Racing, is that is that a full time job? It's a full time job. Yeah. I mean, it's eighty percent of what I do. And yeah, I've been very lucky where the past three years I've been able to race full time and pay my bills off of racing. But you know what people don't see is the behind the scenes part yeah. where it's you know I'm at the computer making cold calls or sending emails out or make my own renderings you know I'm at the computer for at the times 12 to 14 hours a day and you know I get, I get drained out just staring at the computer and, yeah and you and haven't even stepped on the track yet exactly and <laughs> yeah. the, the most frustrating thing is is when deals don't come together like yeah like I'll use California as an example or even Phoenix you know this this year um, I worked really hard to sell sponsorship for California and Phoenix and unfortunately I, I came out dry for both races so you know you, you spend two or three weeks just busting your butt Yep. working on deals and they don't come to they don't come through but on the other end i've been really lucky with like like even some of my sponsors right now like a big one of mine is insurance king mm-hmm. and they're out of rockford illinois and i put almost no thought into going after them i just shot them a facebook message on facebook and they came back and said you know we, we're interested we want to learn more and we, we talked on the phone so you know you got the sponsors you work really really hard after and you got some that you don't you know you, you don't and, um, you know, it's just different approaches, different companies, what makes sense for them. And it's interesting because that's, I mean, that's how the non-racing business world is as well. I mean, we, you know, we have engineering departments, sales departments, marketing departments, and they're all really, really important. You got to have good product. You got to have good engineers, good designers. But if you don't have a marketing channel or a team selling it, it doesn't really do anybody any good. So it's like in the racing world, you got to be a great driver, but you also have to dig into the game. You got to be a good business guy, person and a good salesperson. Yeah. And, and even growing up karting, you know, you had drivers who were beating me constantly Yeah, and you know, they may have just not been able to put the business side of things together and they're not where I am today. And you know, you feel bad at times, but it's a cutthroat sport. Just it like, is just like any business, you know, you, yeah. you have to set aside your emotions and there's times where, you know, I'll, I'll feel bad for somebody because they didn't make the race or they had a sponsor or fall through or something. And then I think to myself, you know, I've been in that position. So, you know, it's, it's, it's like any other business it's very cutthroat at times. I think it's probably even more. Yeah. And I'm sure you kind of need to probably pull back and take a longer term view on, on it. Like it might, it probably sucks that week, that day, but if you pull back and say, you know what, I've made a ton of progress over the last five years, it probably softens the bowl a little bit. Yeah. I mean, you know, looking back at, at, times where we sent other cars home and qualifying you know you feel bad for them and then after the week and you think about it and it, it's progress for you yeah you know which is at the end of the day that's what you want to do you want to make progress and you're still part of it yeah you know it's not and there's a lot of people that have the dream just to be part of it one time and just being a part of it over a decade is is pretty cool yeah so what's your ultimate goal on the is it is it staying focus on NASCAR is it sports car racing it's where do you want to go where, what does the next 10 years look like right now for the next 10 years I'm fully committed to what I'm doing right now yeah and I want to I want to win races you yeah. know <laughs> I, I I'm very lucky to be in the position where I am able to make a career out of racing um but at the same time it gets frustrating sometimes running you know you're running 110 percent for 20th place you know 25th place whatever it is yeah um eventually you know I, I do want to take the ladder up and and hopefully race for more competitive teams and you know, my, my strength right now is road courses. So mm-hmm. this year I feel like we can go to the road courses and, and get in the top 10, maybe a top five. You know, if we're lucky, it's a long shot. But we've seen it before, win a race. Yep. Um, but I do want to be able to drive for that, that team that's able to win races on, on a weekly basis. And, you know, hopefully in 10 years I'm there. So of all the tracks you've run, where does Road America still rank? Number one. Is it really? Yeah, not, not just because it's my home track. Um, yeah. Just – it's beautiful you know the track has a lot of elevation it's fast it has some slow corners it's perfect for the high horsepower yeah cars. yeah it yeah. is it, it, you know at the end of the day it's still a driver's track and, yeah and you know just going there brings back so many memories because it's one of the first tracks i've ever been to yeah um so road america's number one nice so we actually uh so we've got a few racing people here at wisconsin lighting land we recently um got a racing simulator we installed, installed i racing so we'll have to take you up and yeah have you go around road america and show us how it's done okay but what is i mean how big of a of a role does i racing play in your your weeks between races and learning tracks and then you know i've I, I haven't had that much time on it i've been running indycar at road america but it's amazing. The physics are pretty darn close to, to reality. Yeah. I mean, do you are you on it every single week? Yeah. So that's that's funny you bring that up right now. I just literally this last weekend bought a better computer to support my eye racing. Nice. Because for the last five years, I've had a really cheap hard drive that I can barely play 
online by myself mm -hmm. and when i go try to join a lobby with other people it just glitches and my yep. frames per second was like under 10. need a, need a better it was awful graphics card right yeah so i yeah. bought a computer from somebody here in Fond du Lac. okay and they built it for me and um i've played non-stop for like the last three days since, <laughs> since i've had it because it's it's so incredible the difference it makes and the graphics are awesome and i've been running a porsche a lot at sebring because it's 12 hours of yep. sebring weekend so um i use iRacing a lot and, and especially i think i'll use it this year a lot um one of my weaknesses coming from road course racing, I don't quite have the knowledge of setting up these oval cars, you know, the NASCAR race cars or whatever. It's a late model. Mm -hmm. So I really want to use iRacing to help hone that skill. So I've actually had a notepad where I'll take notes and I'll make changes and I'll, I'll see how they affect the car. And you don't always get 100% feeling because mine isn't motion, yep. but you do get a feeling. And, you know, I think you can translate that to, real life and when i go to the track and you know at least my communication skills with my crew chief that weekend yeah yeah it's it's pretty it's pretty close to reality the, the one big thing it, it misses the the throttle response like it's hard to you can't feel your rear tires yeah so but you know everything else you know tur early turn-ins versus trill braking and everything else like man this thing is pretty dialed in yeah yeah and there's times too where you yeah, you're missing that butt feel. And if you have a $100,000 simulator with motion, that's a little bit different. Yeah. But, you know, with, with my simulator, it's just the pedals and the wheel. Um, you're missing that, that feeling. So, you know, when the car gets a little bit free on you, especially at ovals, I think it's more challenging on ovals because you're always on the limit in real life. Yes. So when you're close to that limit in iRacing, you know, you might not feel it step out. And by that yep. time, it's too late to correct it. But, you know, it's a phenomenal tool to familiarize yourself with new tracks or yep. even tracks that you, you're going to for the first time in a year or two, you know, like, like mid Ohio, you know, I don't get to race there as often as I used to. We just go there once a year in the NASCAR Xfinity series. Mm -hmm. So I'll play the whole two or three weeks before that. Cause that's the track we're strong at the track where I'll just go on I racing and just log laps in the Xfinity car. So when I go to the track in real life, I have most of my breaking points down. Have you tried it with an Oculus? I have VR set? Well, we, we've got one. Do you? It's still, it's, it's a little finicky. We're still trying to get it calibrated and set up, but uh, I did like a half a lap uh, uh, one night last week, and it's it's pretty cool. And I've done it once before, and I was running a, uh, a new Ford GT at Road America, and I was getting the same sensations. Like I was looking at my gauges in the same spots and like, you know, I was adjusting myself in the seat in the same spots that I do when I'm actually yeah. on track. So once you get that Oculus on, it's, it's pretty sweet. That is cool. I have that. It's completely different, but for PlayStation 4 and, and Gran Turismo. And um, I actually get motion sickness after like, half, <laughs> really? half, like after like half an hour. So that's one reason I haven't invested in it yet because I feel like for what I use it for, it might not be as beneficial because I get motion sickness. But at the same time, when I look at a lot of these actual, you know, big cup drivers that are using the manufacturer simulators, they're all still using the screen. Are they? And I think for, for a reason, they're probably not using motion. You know, I think motion is, or the, the VR is really cool. Yeah. But I, I think for what I use it for, I think it's more beneficial to use it on a screen. And I might be wrong, you know. Yeah, I never thought about that. I did a VR headset uh, on it basically it simulated a roller coaster and I, I made it through like a quarter of one one lap and I, I was getting sick yeah so yeah I guess it's better to use the screen and be able to put more seat time in yeah. <laughs> than to use the oculus so who are some of your racing heroes ah that's tough growing up it was always Michael Schumacher okay just because when I was growing up he was just dominant yeah I loved the red cars um another one was Jeff Gordon because he had bright race cars, but he was also, I mean, he was, he was dominating too, you know? Yeah. And he was good on Anything. big tracks, small tracks, yeah. road, road courses. Yeah. yeah. And, um, you know, going back now, I, I, I still think those two are some of my racing heroes and even on a different note, like Travis Pastrana, you know, mm -hmm. growing up kind of in the motocross world too, the guy was just a daredevil and he was nuts. And I mean, anything he wanted to do, he could bas basically accomplish. You Have know, you had a chance to meet any of those guys? Never Pastrana okay. yet. Um, I've met quite a few motocross riders who, yeah. when I was riding motocross, I looked up to, and I thought yep. that was pretty cool. But, you know, Pastrana, if he wanted to go rally racing, he'd go rally racing, he'd be competitive. You know, when he came to NASCAR, he had a little bit of trouble, but he still did it, and I give him a lot of props for that. Nice. So we were, we were talking before we started, but, you know, one of the goals that we have with uh, this Will cast is not only to interview people and, you know, technologists in our industry, but also Wisconsinites that are making a, a mark on their industries. Um, and you'd mentioned that, you know, you know, obviously Wisconsin has a long history of racing, whether it's Road America or, or Slinger or other, you know, other tracks. But you'd mentioned that this year was the first year at Daytona that there was no Wisconsinite actually running. In the 500, In the yeah. 500, I, I okay. want to say it was like 40 or 50 years I saw wow. a stat. You know, with Paul Menard retiring, 
uh, he was the last Wisconsin driver in the Cup Series. And, you know, I won't be full-time in the Cup Series this year. I'll run yep. quite a few Cup races. Um, so it'll be cool to keep the Wisconsin Heritage in NASCAR in the Cup Series and uh, even the Xfinity Series. You know, there's no uh, Wisconsin driver in the Xfinity Series. Oddly enough, I think there's four or five truck drivers in the, in the mm-hmm. truck series. So you got all of them in the truck series, but you know, the top two series in NASCAR, there's no Wisconsin drivers. So, so who are the Wisconsin drivers in the truck series? So you're, you're doing part-time yes. truck, right? Yeah. So I'm part-time between the truck series, Xfinity series yep. and the cup series. Um, I'll run probably 30 to 40 races this year. Last year we ran 42. I was really lucky. Wow. Um, it, it's a lot, but then I, <laughs> I look, I look at some guys like Tony Stewart ran like 90 in his spring car. So I'm like, all right, that's, that's a lot. That's cool. Yeah. But, uh, in the truck series, you got Johnny Sauter full-time time Majeski full-time um uh natalie decker she's part-time Derek cross he's full-time he they're all late model drivers you know they're all circle track mm-hmm. drivers you got myself and then you have somebody else uh louis gentine or uh not gentine that's ceo of sergento <laughs> louis louis goss yeah and he's um he's i think he's gonna run a couple races well so maybe I, that's, I, a, that's a good sign that over the next few years more Wisconsinites are going to be making it up to the uh the cup cup level i, I hope so you know yeah. Johnny Sauter, I think he's pretty comfortable where he's at in the truck series. He's been around for a long time. But Simon Jeske, he's a great driver. Um, uh, Derek Cross, you know, those two I think will eventually – they want to move up to the Xfinity. And Ty has had opportunities in Xfinity. Mm-hmm. But, you know, he um, he took his budget and went full-time truck racing with a winning team. So I felt like that was probably the best move for him. Nice. So if people want to contact you for anything, sponsorship opportunities, other partnerships – where can they reach you at? Facebook. Josh, Facebook. <laughs> Josh Balicki Racing. Uh, Instagram, Josh Balicki. And Twitter, Josh Balicki. I mean, I, I maintain all of it. So I read my messages constantly, um, whether they're hero card requests or they're nice. uh, just messages, you know, questions. I, I try to answer all of them. Awesome. Well, thanks a lot for coming on. Yeah. This was a lot you. of fun. I appreciate we'll it. Thank you for yeah. having me. Yeah, absolutely.